I love Anko Daily. I, it's one of the first things I read. And every morning when I'm kind of catching up on the news and it's been a, a, a really great way to learn about others in the oncology community. And, and so thank you for providing this really wonderful resource. We are um, fostering the, the most innovative, groundbreaking research and always kind of keeping a very sharp eye on our mission towards um, victory over cancer, helping the V Foundation grantees to um, move to the next level. Mission and, and message was very enduring and it was don't give up, don't ever give up. I do think I am a pretty transparent leader. Hello everyone and welcome back to Onco Daily. Today on Onco Influencers, we are privileged to host uh, Dr. Susanna Greer, the Chief Scientific Officer of the V Foundation. Uh, welcome to Onco Daily. Thank you very much for being with us today. Um, I'll just make a brief introduction about yourself and then we'll go ahead with the interview, okay? Sounds great. Thank you. So Dr. Greer is, as I mentioned, is the chief uh, scientific officer of the V Foundation. And in this role, she's a visionary ambassador of the V Foundation who works with the scientific advisory committee of the foundation to steer funding to the most promising research opportunities. An accomplished strategist, she develops and articulates priorities to enhance the V Foundation's research portfolio gifts, grants, and sponsorships that advance the foundation's distinguished, uh, distinctive branch of cutting edge and disruptive research. Prior to joining the foundation, uh, Dr. Greer was a, a senior scientific director at the American Cancer Society, where she led the biochemistry and immunology of cancer research program. Uh, prior to uh, American Cancer Society, uh, Dr. Greer was recruited to Georgia State University as a Georgia Cancer Coalition Distinguished Cancer Scholar, where she directed the university-level molecular basis of disease program and was a tenured professor in the Department of Biology. Uh, she has a very big bio, so I'm not going to read all of them. Uh, and we'll try to explore uh, during the interview Dr. Greer's uh, career and the story of success. Uh, just I'll mention uh, that she resides in Atlanta with her husband, Chad and son Fletcher. She enjoys kayaking, hiking, is a, a peloton addict and is happiest in her garden. Thank you very much again for, for um, accepting our invitations. Uh, invitation, I know how busy you are uh, with your daily work um and today we'll um with my first email i asked you we are going to explore your story of success what's the key to success to dr greer and the first question is can you share some key milestones in your career uh, that have shaped your journey as a scientist and leader in cancer research uh, thank you so much well first thank you for it was a really nice introduction and Thanks for having me. Um, I shared before we started, I love Anko Daily. I, it's one of the first things I read. And every morning when I'm kind of catching up on the news and it's been a, a, a really great way to uh, learn about others in the oncology community. And, and so thank you for providing this really wonderful resource. And certainly thank you for having me today. Thank you. Um, so I think your question is about how, just kind of how did I get started and, and what were my, you know, I think for many of us, um, and it's something I think about a lot, you know, I, I would never have begun in the scientific field if someone wouldn't have reached out to me and, and seen that maybe I had some talents that, while rough, could have been um accelerated. So I had a, a high school AP chemistry teacher. Her name was Susan Smith, uh, and she was fantastic. And then when I went on to college, I had a dean, uh, Dr. Dr. Barbara Mixon. She was a physical chemist. I, I went on to get a degree in physical chemistry, and you know, she was just amazing. And um, physical chemistry became a subject that I, I absolutely loved. 
I, I'm, I'm from a very small town in South Georgia. I never had heard of physical chemistry. And so, yeah, Dean Mixon was the one who helped me to even know physical chemistry existed. And then I just fell in love with the subject matter that taught me about molecules and atoms and, you know, how matter behaves on this molecular level, which became the foundation of my career. So I think having these two people, they turned out to be women who loved science and took an interest in me. You know, that was the beginning of my love of science. And I've tried to think about that a lot during my career of how I could help other people who I saw that inkling of maybe some talent and, and, and reach down and help them out as I was helped out. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much also for your kind words about the Onco Daily. This is really very inspiring to continue the work we are doing. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as the Chief Scientific Officer of the V Foundation, what are your primary responsibilities and how do you envision steering the foundation toward its goals? Well, I, I guess I'll kind of lean on the, the what you previously asked me and, and go into that. So I as chief scientific officer, I lean on my previous career and I think a lot about the people that I, I work with and work for all the time. So obviously I left academia, ran an academic lab, and I had all the different positions of the people that we are trying to support at the V Foundation. So of course I was a grad student, I was a postdoc, I was a professor. So at the V Foundation, we are supporting individuals from the assistant professor and on up. So I think for one thing, I would say it's important that I've had those roles. So my responsibility, you know, as chief scientific officer is to think really broadly about how we direct funding and how we are directing those funds to the most promising opportunities and investigators um, to move the bar in cancer. Um, you can't do that, <laughs> shouldn't do that as a sole individual. So I work really closely with our scientific advisory committee who I would hold up against any scientific committee um, in the world. They are absolutely outstanding. And so with that scientific advisory committee, we are, you know, I, I set um, our funding opportunities and priorities. And then also, so I have one kind of role in the scientific space and in the scientific community. And then I have another foot or role in the um, development space where I'm trying to help communicate, work with our marketing and development team to make sure that we are communicating all of the amazing work that our grantees are doing. Um, to help enhance the portfolio of gifts and grants and sponsorships that the V Foundation has in order that we can leverage those gifts to have more, of course, um, work done in the scientific space. So I kind of have a leg in, in both of those um, spaces, both in the development side and in the side of working um, with you know, directing funds. Um, so always, always, always in everything I do, you know, my focus is on making sure that we are um, fostering the, the most innovative, groundbreaking research um, and always kind of keeping a very sharp eye on our mission towards um, victory over cancer. Um, when I think about what the V Foundation does, our primary goal always is to, or in, in my way of thinking about it, is, is we fund um, very high risk, high reward research. So as chief scientific officer, I'm either trying to communicate that, <laughs> trying to raise money for that, or I am I'm trying to strategically communicate that to the scientific community and trying to make sure we reward those grants in, in the best way possible. Yeah. Wonderful, That's wonderful. Uh, don't you miss academia? That's a great question. Um, you know, when I was a professor, I, I had started my own company. And so 
in some ways I already, and so in the company that I had was um, Greer Consulting, Science Speakeasy. So I was already helping scientists when I had that company to leverage their ideas and their innovations to help raise money for their research. So I had one foot out the door a little bit. Um, and in starting that company, I realized that one thing that I was good at was helping scientists to take whatever their technology was, how, no matter how complicated the language, and to help that researcher to turn that really complicated technology and language into words that could anyone could understand. Um, and I got as much joy, quite frankly, from helping that researcher, as long as it was a researcher that I enjoyed working with and an idea I believed in, I got as much joy from that process as I did, honestly, in leveraging my own ideas and my own research. So your question is complicated. Of course, I miss in, in a very personal way running my own lab, but I still get that same joy and that same excitement from helping the V Foundation grantees to um, move to the next level. And I feel like I have the opportunity to make a much bigger impact in a much broader way on cancer than I would have had I stayed in my own lab running my own research. And honestly, I knew if I shut down my lab that someone smarter than me would fill that space. And, and that's exactly what happened. So it was, um, it was not lost on me that I would miss I would miss my grad students and postdocs coming in with their data. But now, I mean, we have, we funded 1,260 grantees at the V Foundation. So I get to see all of their data all the time. And I take immense joy in that and immense pride. Wonderful. That's really wonderful. But can you elaborate a bit more about the mission of the V Foundation? And I mean, what's the difference between the V Foundation and other cancer research organizations or foundations? That's a great, it's a great question. So our mission is very simple. It's to achieve victory over cancer. So the V Foundation was funded in 1993 by ESPN and the late Jim Valvano. And um, Jim Valvano's mission and, and message was very enduring. And it was don't give up, don't ever give up, which I love. I think it applies to cancer patients, of their families. It certainly applies to researchers. And it is a guiding principle that drives the V Foundation to fund the best and brightest cancer researchers. And it drives um, myself and my colleagues to never give up on our mission. So we have a very comprehensive approach to funding research. And so I think my answer to your question is threefold. Um, one, I think that in some ways we are similar to other oncology or organizations that fund oncology research. So. We fund all cancers um, and we also fund across all patient journeys, meaning from hopefully where you and I sit, which is in cancer prevention. We also fund in early detection. A lot of our funding sits in cancer treatment. Um, we also fund in survivorship and palliative care. And we also fund, which is really important to our mission across the scientific journey, meaning we fund in you know, very developmental re work, we fund translational research, and we also fund clinical research. So in that way, we're not that different from other large oncology funding you know, nonprofits. I think what makes us quite different is to our two things, and that would be how we fund the research and actually um, what we fund. So what sets us apart um, would be our giving pledge, first of all. And this is um, really one of the reasons that I came to the V Foundation. So we have a commitment that 100% of funds go directly to research. It's made impossible by our endowment. So we have an ability to ensure that our funds are used efficiently and effectively. Um, and this leads to, you know, these significant advancements in the field from, you know, all the way from prevention to palliative care. It's something that I take immense pride in. So I said I had one foot in the scientific space, I spent a lot of time talking to cancer center directors, to applicants. 
I also spend a lot of time um, talking to donors. And so being able to say without hesitation that contributions and donations, whether you're going to give a dollar to the V Foundation or millions, go directly to groundbreaking research is not something that every organization can offer. And we have, I believe, an unmatched impact in cancer research. So to me, we're the best investment that you can make if you've been impacted by cancer and, and want to make an impact on cancer research. So we have a request for application process that we um, in our, what's called our flagship portfolio. So four times a year, we send out um, a request for application to designated cancer centers in the United States and their Canadian equivalents. And so each of those cancer centers um, is allowed to nominate one individual. So these are some of the best cancer centers in the world. They then nominate their best um, researcher. And each cancer center has a pretty uh, comparable process for how they're gonna nominate their researcher for our request for applications. And then those individuals compete against each other. <laughs> um, so it, in order to receive a V Foundation grant, I mean, the, these are absolutely some of the best researchers in the world. Our grants are reviewed by our scientific advisory committee. Each application is reviewed by three scientific experts and one um, biostatistician on our scientific advisory committee. I, of course, play no role in this process. Um, our scientific advisory committee, you can see them on our website. They are appointed by expertise. They are also, we take great pride in making sure they are diverse, both in geography and race. Um, ethnicity and gender. And so I think the, my second point would be in, in who we fund. So our grantees are absolutely outstanding. So not only if you donate to the V Foundation, can you be assured that your dollars are going to go to research, they're also going to go to some of the best researchers in the world. Um, and those researchers have gone on to have an incredible impact in, in the oncology community. So I've been chief scientific officer for two years and in those two years have um, done a deep dive into the impact that our researchers have had. And, and I'm, I'm really proud of the what we can now communicate about our researchers. Okay, thank you. Could you highlight some of the key initiatives or programs at the V Foundation? Absolutely. We have a fund that honors... Um, well, one that I really like that stands out is the Stu Scott Memorial Cancer Research Fund. Um, for those that may not know, Stuart Scott was a beloved ESPN sportscaster who sadly passed away in 2015 from cancer. In his memory, the V Foundation and ESPN established a fund to address cancer disparities in minority populations and to support researchers from underrepresented groups in science. This fund has awarded almost $16 million to researchers and continues to make an impact, especially with our newly announced partnership with the Dolphins Cancer Challenge, which will focus on cancer disparities in South Florida. Um, there's another fund, uh, the Dick Vital Fund, I'd love to mention. It's another initiative that is making a tremendous impact. Dick Vital is a sportscaster who has personally beat cancer and is currently battling cancer again. His uh, own personal battles with cancer inspired him to be a champion for pediatric research cancer efforts. And this fund not only works to improve and accelerate treatments for children with cancer, but also celebrates childhood cancer survivors at a, an annual gala. The V Foundation has awarded over 84 million in pediatric cancer research grants. And I mean, we're, we're incredibly fortunate at the V Foundation to have people like Dick Vitale who feel as passionate about our mission as we do. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much for all these efforts. Uh, could you share an example of a particularly transformative project that was made possible by the V Foundation support? Absolutely. Um, a project that is near and dear to my heart is a grant of her own. It is one of our 
request for applications in our flagship program called the Women Scientist Innovation Award for Cancer Research. This initiative was created to address the gender disparities in cancer research by funding early career female researchers. This program not only advances cancer research, but it also helps to ensure that women scientists can continue their vital work. And I think it's really important because it brings diverse perspectives and expertise to the field. In fact, we just announced the second class of grantees for this initiative. We awarded over $10 million for the second class of grantees. And I can't wait to see the innovative research findings from this year's class. Nice. Uh, so in what ways do the foundation ensure that is research funding, its research funding is aligned with the most urgent needs in cancer treatment and prevention? I think that's a great question. I rely on the Scientific Advisory Committee in two ways in this space. Um, the first is that we do identify critical research areas that require immediate attention. For example, this year, we focused on colorectal cancer due to its rising incidence in young adults. This is more in an educational space. We, we highlighted a, a, the emphasis on colorectal cancer at several of our signature events because we wanted to educate our donors about these pressing, pressing issues and direct resources to where they were needed most. Um, the other way, I think more globally, that the V Foundation tries to ensure that our funding is aligned with urgent needs in treatment and prevention is that I rely on the individuals who are on the front lines. So I don't run a research lab anymore, but the people who do are the individuals who are submitting grants. <laughs> So we rely on individuals who are running research labs, individuals who are treating cancer patients and, clini and are clinician scientists. They're the ones who are being nominated by their cancer centers. And they're the ones who are seeing the needs in the cancer community, identifying the biggest challenges. They're the ones that are being nominated by their cancer centers. They are the ones that are being reviewed by the Scientific Advisory Committee, and those are the grants that rise to the top. So I think in that way, the V Foundation is ensuring that our funding is aligned with, with what are the biggest challenges in the field and how are they being met by the absolute best researchers um, who, who can meet these challenges. I'm talking about the challenges. What are the mm -hmm. biggest challenges you face in your role? And... <laughs> How do you overcome to, uh, them to ensure the foundation's objectives are met? You know, I think I really appreciated this question because it, it did make me think a little bit. I think for most nonprofits, one, especially in the oncology space, one challenge is mission drift. Cancer patients have overwhelming needs. So one of the challenges that I face is a good one, and that is that I have an amazing group of people um, who come to me with lots of great ideas. So one of my challenges is helping our organization to stay very focused on the mission that Jim Valvano set forth, which was that we are primarily we are not primarily, we are a research funding organization. So I rely on a outstanding scientific advisory committee um, to help me be a great sounding board. I rely on an amazing board that we have to be a great sounding board. So I think when I think about the challenges we have is that no one organization can meet all the needs of the cancer community. That's my biggest challenge probably. Lots of people know the V Foundation is really great at what we do. 
the way that I meet, the, and so they come to us with great ideas of, could we do this? Could we do that? And the answer is absolutely yes. We could do lots of different things, but anytime we decide to do something else, it may take away from what I think that we are the best at, which quite frankly is funding the most outstanding research in cancer. So I, how do I meet that problem? How do I meet that challenge? Is that I rely on an outstanding scientific advisory committee, an outstanding board, and quite frankly, an outstanding group of colleagues to be a good sounding board to say, what about this idea? What about that? Are we going to move forward with this? Um, we talk about it and then we come to a conclusion and it helps us to stay on the straight and narrow to really think about, you know, what does this do to help us accomplish our mission? Um, and I think that's great advice for any team when you're faced with you know, a good, good suggestion, good challenge, you know, does this help to move our mission forward? And you think about it and then you move on. So yeah, good, good, good challenges to have, but mission drift is definitely a challenge for, for any foundation. Balancing a high impact career with personal interests can be challenging, right? How do your personal hobbies and interests like gardening and kayaking influence your professional life and vice versa. Well, I, I'd say I wish I had more time for them. <laughs> um, but, you know, any anyone who has ever planted a seed, um, first of all, believes in a miracle. Um, but also gardening is, is one of my great loves. And it definitely helps you to slow down. There's been some great papers that have come out recently on scientists needed more time to think. And I think that anything that helps you to slow down, think a little bit, like gardening, I love to exercise, like kayaking, just being still with myself is really important. And there's a lot to be learned in the time that it takes to nurture a plant and let it grow. I mean, the similarities to research are, are obvious, right? Planting the seed of an idea, and growing that into a research project or planting the seed into a graduate student and then helping that graduate student to formulate ideas over time and really nurturing that student to grow. I mean, right, these are, these are all things that have commonalities. Um, I took up yoga about a year ago and I hated it in the beginning because I was really terrible at it. <laughs> I don't like to not be good at things. <laughs> And I think that, but now I really love it because it's hard, it's challenging. Um, there's some people in my yoga class that can stand on their head. And if I tried to stand on my head, that would be my last day probably on this planet because it just would not turn out well, but I can still try. And I think that's a lot about what science is about, um, is just try. And that's what the V Foundation does, right? We go for those really high risk, high reward projects. And they don't all work out, right? Sometimes it's Dr. Greer trying to stand on her head and it's a huge failure, but sometimes it's that amazing plant that you take a chance on and it gives this incredible container garden or you get this great yoga pose or you actually are able to kayak down these rapids that you never thought you could do. And yeah, I think there's so many parallels in just taking your time, being thoughtful, being mindful, and really going for something that is so hard and takes time and energy and effort. So yeah, there's tons of parallels in gardening and in sports, of course, um, and in science. Uh, what advice do you have for individuals who aspire to lead in the field of cancer research and make a lasting impact? Well, I would say, I mean, we need you, first of all. <laughs> um, cancer is so hard. And I think it's an incredibly challenging career, but it is, is so worth it. The reason I became a cancer researcher is because I just didn't understand it. I'm a cancer, I'm an immunologist by training. And I think anyone who thinks they understand the immune system is just wrong. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, you know, I, I love... I think I still, it amazes me that how, how much just in that space, 
since I got my PhD in immunology that we've learned. And so I think my first piece of advice is lean in, right? Lean in to what feels good and exciting and then keep leaning towards that and don't be afraid to go on a different path. I never, ever in a thousand years would have predicted I would have the job I have now, but I just kept leaning towards things that felt good. And the biggest, I think, mistake that I made early in my career was doing things that I was good at, but that didn't necessarily bring me a ton of joy. I was always really good at research, really good at writing grants. But I also love doing what I do now, which is leading a team, helping other scientists to really elevate their research. And it took me kind of setting aside the competitive part of Susanna um, to realize that I don't have to run a research lab to really contribute to science in big ways. And I think taking that piece of me away was probably the, the biggest groundbreaking part of my career. So um, there have been some really hard times, right? I can remember sitting on the floor of my brand new lab and just crying because I didn't know how to assemble a tissue culture hood and it was just in pieces. You know? <laughs> or, <laughs> um, you know, we all had those days. I remember one of my first days when I was at the American Cancer Society, I was at the top of my career when I left academia and I got to the American Cancer Society and I didn't know how to find the staplers or where they kept the office supplies. And so that's just kind of how it is in the career path of a scientist is you get to the top and you go to the bottom again. And so I think you have to just be okay with those successes and then be ready to go right down to the bottom and just learn. Um, but yeah, we need you. We need those bright minds. Cancer is really hard. So those, all those moments taught me to be resilient, um, taught me to embrace challenge. And I really love that. Um, I have to be busy to be happy. Um, I really need to be challenged. And the best part, the absolute best part of my job now are the people I work with, um, full stop both my colleagues at the V Foundation, the board that we have, our scientific advisory committee, and our our grantees, the cancer centers. I mean, that there there is no better job. I have the best job on the planet. So um, when I'm ready to step down, you can come get my job. Wonderful. Uh, what's the key to your success? Oh, gracious. Um, you know, I do think I am a pretty transparent leader. Um, I learned I had an amazing postdoctoral advisor. Her name is Dr. Jenny Ting. She's still the smartest person I've ever met. And she was very clear about her expectations for the fellows in her lab, for around the resources that we had in the lab. She gave very clear feedback. And I've tried to mimic that um, as I've was a PI and, and then became a leader outside the academic space. So I think openly communicating with my team, sp specifically when things aren't great, like when there are challenges, I think becomes really important. Um, it fosters professional growth in team members and helps everybody to feel like they're included. Um, I want to under I want my teams to understand the rationale behind decisions to help them feel empowered, um, and you know that we're an open and team, and that everyone is mutually supportive. Um, I think it if everyone feels valued on a team, that we have shared objectives, it, it's absolutely key. So, yeah, I think being transparent as a leader is super important. What are your top three books? Oh, gosh, this is a hard question. My mom was an English teacher, um, so I'm afraid <laughs> she's going to read this interview and judge me. Um, all right. I really loved The Secret Garden as a kid. Um, it's probably not a huge shocker by Frances Burnett. Um, I mean, it, maybe it made me love gardening, but it's this amazing story about, you know, this like the magic of a garden and how it can restore you. So it's a beautiful book if you've never read it. Um, 
Oh, let's see. A second one. Um, I love Little Women. Um, Little Women by uh, Louisa May Alcott. Uh, that's a great book. Um, that, that book has kind of a cool story behind it. If you know much about that, you know, it, it highlights the lives of these four women. And the, the reason, the reason I'm thinking about that book is because um, it's actually based. I mean, I don't think it's a big secret that it's actually based on the life of the author. And, and it's kind of a cool story because um, I think from what I've read, you know, I of course read that book as a child. I remember he read it probably 10 times, but the her editor wanted her to write just kind of like a love story and she didn't. She actually wrote about hard topics, right? About love and war and um, like it's not a girl's book. It has real themes in it. It's a beautiful story. After that, um, my favorite book is kind of whatever I'm reading now. And actually I just reread Educated. I don't know if you've read that book. It's a great book. So I just took my only son to college, um, which was hard. Um, I just actually two days ago took him to the University of Georgia and left him and <laughs> my baby, my 18 year old big baby. Um, <laughs> he'll be fine. Y'all don't worry about me. I'll be fine too. Probably. Um, and so educated by Tara Westover, and that is an amazing book. Um, and it's about, uh, it's a memoir and it's about growing up in Idaho, I think, in this crazy abusive family. And it's just this story of resilience and the power of education. And I wanted to read that before my son went to college to remind me how incredibly lucky he is to be able to pursue education and you would know, have this amazing opportunity to go to college. So um, that is a great book. But yeah, I just, I kind of love, I don't know, whatever I'm reading now. Um, so we'll see what my next favorite book is. Um, but that, I just finished that. So do you have something I should read? <laughs> I just finished uh, it. So I need a new book. Right now I have several books on my, on my uh, table. Uh, one I just started rereading. Uh, it's the introduction to the global health, which is uh, the which has the stories of um, the the global health challenges. Right. There is a the, the I'm trying to remember the author of the book, but uh, there is a foreword by of Paul Farmer, and I was just reading the chapter of uh, about the. Uh, AIDS epidemic and how these challenges were overcome. So, this is this is a really a great book, and which I was reading just a few days ago. All right, I jotted it down. Uh -huh. I, 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 I mean, uh, usually I read several books just at the same time. But this one, it was just on, on the table. Uh, one of those, I can't do that. Yeah, and I I'm, I started reading um, recently also some, some of the books I was reading during the childhood. I love this, uh, the book, history books. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I loved all of the... Um, I just, yeah, one... I was looking back at the books that my son, I had read to my son when he was little. So, you know, I, I would come up with those too, but yeah, recently. Um, yeah. I would say little women. That's, that's definitely a top one in secret garden. Yeah. I'm going to stick with those as being my favorites. Yeah. Those Wonderful. are great books. Wonderful. Uh, the last question, who mm -hmm. should we interview next? Mm, oh my gosh. Okay, that's really hard. I have 1,260 favorite humans of the V Foundation grantees um, who I would like for you to interview all of them. So I, I will say, okay, so there's a really warm space in my heart for the V Foundation Scientific Advisory Committee. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna offer the chair. So the chair is Dr. Nancy Davidson. Um, she's at the Hutch. She's a world-renowned breast cancer researcher. And I think 
hearing from her, I mean, so breast cancer is, a, a, of course, a huge challenge. It's also a place where we have made enormous strides um, in how we approach this disease. Um, Dr. Davidson is an amazing human <laughs> on top of being an amazing oncologist. And it, it really impresses me when people of her caliber decide to give of their time, energy, and effort to things like the Bee Foundation because of course, our scientific advisory committee donates their time, energy, and effort to us. They they review 12 grants each for each of our requests for applications. We have four of them, so they're reviewing 30. Well, they're, they are reviewing between 36 and 48 grants a year for us. Um, and then, of course, participate in the calls themselves, which are, you know, at least six hours long. That's a lot of time. <laughs> And then they come to our, we have a, a, a strategy session um, a, that, that is in person. It's an enormous amount of time to volunteer for an organization. So I am honored by her time, energy, and service. So I, I would, yeah, I think she'd be a great person for you to talk to, um, either related to the V Foundation or not. She's an amazing human and has given um, a lot to our organization. Wonderful. I can give you one, one or two more if you like. Um, just yeah, of course, away. of course. Um, I, I mean, so I am an immunologist. So, I'll, I'll, so uh, Evan Weber, Dr. Evan Weber, he's at Penn, um, and he had a really cool Nature paper out not too long ago um, around Fox One um, and CAR T cells. So I would, I would look at Evan. And then I'm going to give you two more. Let me see. I had a couple pulled up that I really liked recently. Um, I mean, these folks. Okay, here's one. I want you to think about Dr. Jamie Spangler at Hopkins. J-A-M-I-E, Jamie Spangler. Um, she had a cell paper that I absolutely loved a few weeks ago. Um, really cool paper on... Um, antibodies uh, looking at down regulation of, uh, per, of uh, PDL1. And then I'm going to give you one not at all related to my field, just a, a paper that I loved um, and, and an individual who I think is just blowing it out of the water. Um, let me find this one. Okay. Oh my goodness. Okay. Francisco Sanchez uh, Rivera. Um, he's at MIT and uh, just doing some amazing things on prime editing sensor libraries. Yeah. Three solid recommendations there. But I, I again, I got 1,257 others. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, our, our grantees are truly, uh, you didn't ask for this, but I'm going to tell you, uh, we funded them. Of our 1,260 grantees, they have, we've funded right now, I mean, and obviously these numbers change by the day, but last time I looked, uh, 5,500 grants, that was as of this morning, and that's to a total of, as of this morning, um, $353 million and some change. So those grantees have, have published over 90,000 publications. Wow. Um, and then they have leveraged that $353 million to $19.5 billion in additional follow-on funding and an additional 5,500 grants. It's incredible. Wow. And then additional, you know, they've participated, participated in over a thousand clinical trials. So I, when I tell you we fund the best, I'm not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, we obviously leave a lot of good grants. You know, my mission is in cancer. So when I tell you my biggest challenge is mission drift, it's because we do leave a lot of really amazing research on the table. But I have my goal is to make every dollar go as far as it can. And if you give me a dollar for research, I'm going to try to invest it in the best research I can and to do the most and best with it that I can. Um, so that's probably the biggest challenge I have is we have to make some really hard decisions. Um, there's never enough, never enough money. Um, but we're doing, I think, really amazing work with what we have. So I'm very proud, very proud. Before we Hopefully close, 
before we close, uh, and uh, by the way, I, I, I found the name of the book. It's the in uh, Introduction to Global Health Delivery by Joya Muharaji. And oh, it's thanks. about the yeah. equity, human rights, and the global global uh, health. So, um, okay. why you are only focused on the United in the United States and Canada, and why you are not going beyond? That's a great question. Um, I I would say that if we that has been posed to us before. Again, it's one of those hard questions we get. Right. If we were able to. So because I ran a research lab, I spend a lot of time thinking about I don't want to, I don't want applicants to waste their time applying for our grants. Right. So I think I spend a lot of time thinking about pay lines. So I want to make sure that our pay lines are high enough because the caliber of researchers that are applying for our grants are truly outstanding. So I want to make sure our pay lines are high enough that people are not wasting their time. Our pay lines are going to be high. You know, we don't, we don't, we're not going to mess around with, you know, 6%, 8%, 10% pay lines. So until I can get my pay lines high enough, we, we can't move beyond where we are now. Um, beyond that, but I will say, so that that is maybe not the best answer to your question, but it is it is an answer, right? If we can't fund all the outstanding research in North America, I can't justify moving beyond the confines. There is certainly amazing research that happens all over this world. Um, my second answer, so I, I think that, that that's probably where I sit right now. Um, I will say that the research that happens here benefits people everywhere, right? As you know, the research that happens in your country is benefiting me and my family, right? I mean, yeah, cancer, of course, the of benefit, course. Of, yeah, the benefit of cancer. Science is international. Yeah, yeah, science is international. Like so I... Yeah. Um, so I, I think, you know, the, the goal of, of having a global funding initiative is certainly not lost on me. Um, but but maybe but one right day. now, maybe one day, maybe one day. Thank you very much, Susanna, for the outstanding uh, interview. It's very motivational and I'm sure our auditorium is going to love it. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. It's been um, my delight. Um, and I'm looking forward to all the wonderful things that we can do together as a, a research community. We certainly have big challenges, but also big opportunities ahead. Wonderful. Thank you. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.